Okay, Jeff, take it away. All right, let me uh, share my screen here. Hopefully, I'm showing the right one. That's my uh, picture of Comet Eagle that I was looking up. All right, so I'm going to give you kind of an overview of solar imaging. Um, well, I, I, rather than just jump straight into the imaging, I thought I'd put a couple of blurbs or a couple of slides on, uh, you know, when the best time to observe. I know there's some people on here that have a, have a, an opinion on that too. Um, and what, what am I going to see when I do this? You know, it, one of the things that I'm trying to do more of is just not take pretty pictures, but actually understand what I'm looking at. Um, I'm by no means an expert of what I'll show you here in a second, but, uh, at least you, it'll you know prompt you to, to look more and want to know more. Um, and then I'll get into equipment, specifically the equipment that I use. I mean, there's lots of equipment you can talk about, but I'll go through the stuff that I have. And then talk about uh, how we acquire the data, uh, the images. And rather than uh, get into, you know, obviously I'm not demoing this um, here because it's nighttime for one, but um, I don't have the capability to do that. Uh, simultaneously with the webcast, but um, I figured I'd just rather give tips and tricks um, and work in, you know, kind of the process of how we acquire and then how we uh, process the imaging. And if there's time at the end, then I can show you uh, some of the images that I've taken recently in the last part of um, 22. As always, if there's questions, you know, feel free to stop uh, along the way. So you can't uh, give in observing the sun or imaging the sun presentation without that that giant disclaimer. So I won't dwell on this, but obviously never look at the sun without uh, the proper protection. It'll at, at a minimum it'll damage your equipment. Um, at a maximum it'll make you go blind. So. <clears throat> So I, I mentioned I was going to talk a little bit about what, what are you seeing, and um, this was kind of interesting for me to just refresh my memory of, you know, a, a little bit of uh, about the sun. The sun is has an interior to it, and then uh, the atmosphere, the out, outer region, what we say. And if you look at the graphic in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that overwhelmingly the majority of what we're talking about is the inner part of the sun the core, the radiative zone, and the convective zone. Um, and then there's this very, very thin layer that makes up the photosphere, chromosphere, uh, this transition region, and then the corona. Um, so when we're looking at, we're imaging these things, whether we're observing it visually or we're looking at it, we're looking at these layers, the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona. And so that's where these features um, lie in it. That's where you're, uh, you're seeing it. For the photosphere, that's where sunspots, uh, faculi, if I'm pronouncing that right, and filamentary structures are visible. Um, obviously, in the corona is, is uh, where uh, prominences are going to appear. So I won't go through the, you know, there's a lot of words on this slide with temperatures and stuff, but I just wanted to, to point out that, you know, the region that we're actually looking at the sun is a very, very thin portion of the sun, uh, outer, outer part of the sun. Um, when to observe. So, you know, if it's sunny out and, you know, I'm not going to uh, uh, say that you can't observe, you know, in the late afternoon or at high noon, you know, you can observe whenever you have time, whenever you have, you know, the sun is out. Um, but generally speaking, uh, I think the general consensus is that mid morning is probably the best time. Um, you want to get the sun high enough in the sky so it gets out of the muck. Um, and you're looking through as, as little atmosphere as possible, but, uh, and after the morning dew or fog is burned off, but not too, too high, uh, or late in the day where the atmosphere is heating up, especially in the summer. Um, and then obviously the, the recommendation is to look at the sun during its peak solar activity. So, um, in the peak of that 11 year cycle that it goes through. Uh, what can I see? So I, I mentioned the layers there. So photosphere, chromosphere, and corona. So those are the different types of features and the layers that which they 
um, show up on. So there is, you, you'll see granulation on the surface of the, the sun, um, faculae, some sunspots, and uh, some of these other features. I stole uh, Lee's images that he shares. I see Lee, you're on, I think. Um, I stole these images from when you send out your images uh, of the sun as a reference of, of the different types of features that you can uh, expect to see when you're observing the sun. So, so Jeff, if you, can you go back to that slide for a second? Yep. Um, you know, so one of the one of the things that's hard to tell is you, you got something labeled there, a detached prominence. <laughs> that's not um, my label. <laughs> oh, all right, all right. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I don't, because if it was truly a detached prominence, it would be a CME. I, I would tend to agree with you. Yeah. Okay. Now, does do a CME rain back down on the sun? No, no, not at all. So maybe that's the difference, because I I have seen, you know, a prominence, you know, kind of like a like a rubber band, it snaps loose, but mm -hmm. then it eventually does rain back down into the sun, and and so at at a at one moment in time, it is actually well, it appears as though it's not connected. Yeah, but it 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 really is the the pieces of the photosphere uh, are are really caught in a magnetic loop, and and so yeah, it may seem to be discontinuous, uh, but unless it snaps off and you know the prominence is uh, a CME will travel at like a million miles an hour, mm -hmm. and so so when they leave the sun, so. Um, so kind of hard to catch one as it's actually leaving. <laughs> right, right. Well, you so, see, you see the animations of it, right? When the SDO right. captures it. Right. But it's always after the fact, yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that these probably aren't technical, you know, all scientific technical terms and maybe there's been some liberty there. So that, I mean, that's, that's really all I wanted to cover. I wanted to make sure before we just jump into imaging it, what you know, what you can expect to see, and why we're even interested in looking at the sun. So there's all kinds of activity uh, every day. You look at the sun, at least if it's sunny, um, and it's changed from the day prior, which is why I find it to be so so interesting um, because it never gets old. The other part, the reason why I like solar is to me there tends to be a lot more sunny days, although not lately. Then there are clear nights, um, and then like uh, you know, planetary and lunar solar uh, imaging is very rewarding and very fast. Right, I can take an image of the sun, and in ten minutes have my completed image and be done for the day. Right, and so it's very rewarding that way that you can walk away very quickly with a, a, a finished result with a, a couple of clicks and some software. So here's here's my equipment. I have uh, I have one dedicated scope on the right hand side there, which is an 80 millimeter blunt f7 solar scope. It is capable of being a normal telescope. It is a normal telescope. It's just they've they've uh, attached the um, uh, Edelon tuners to it. Uh, and in fact, I was looking at the Lunt uh, website when I purchased this. It was just called a solar scope which is why I call it that. But now uh, they've changed their marketing and they call it a universal scope or something like that because they, I think they they didn't want to pigeonhole their, themselves into just selling solar scopes. And people are like, mm -hmm. oh, I want to spend all that money on just a solar scope. So I think they've changed their tune and saying, well, no, you can you can adopt it to uh, solar and and uh, nighttime astronomy, which which is true for this one. I just I never do. I leave it leave it in this configuration. Um, it has integrated H alpha Edelon tuners. Um, and like I said, it's dedicated for solar. And the one thing that I want to mention is, is that you don't need a super expensive mount for solar. Um, it's not critical that you have tracking of the sun down to the pixel scale. As long as it stays on the sensor for the period of time that you're imaging, the, the software will help you know correct for the uh, inaccuracies of tracking. Astron AVX mount. It's very inexpensive, affordable mount, um, and I would never use it for astro imaging of uh, 
deep sky objects, but for the sun, it's it's just fine. Um, and then on the left, I've got some better pictures here coming up too. So I got uh, on the left there, I have um, a stellar view, uh, 130 millimeter F5 scope. So that is my um, go-to for my deep sky imaging. Um, in this, at this time, it's it's converted back to that now. But at this time, I had set it up for visual, um, which is very then easy to adapt. Uh, what I have is a, a Daystar Quark H alpha filter. It's basically an eyepiece that has uh, an H alpha filter built into it, and that's why I call it an on-demand uh, solar observing scope. Um, and I have it on my uh, Astrophysics Mach 2 mount, which is, you know, obviously a very high-end mount, but that's definitely not necessary for for uh, solar observatory. And uh, I have a backup mount, which is my old Celestron CMG, CGEM VX that I will use it on as well. Um, and then I, there's a there's a handful of other things, and I'll I'll walk you through all this stuff here with the Daystar Quark Chromosphere filter. I'll, I'll get into that. Um, I use a just a ZWO ASI-174 planetary camera. Um, this lap dome that you see uh, looks like a little tent there um, is very helpful. I would recommend for solar observing just, just because you're trying to look at your laptop and it's bright, bright sun, and it's very difficult to see your screen in the, you know, the super bright sunlight um, while you're trying to image. So that's very helpful to show your uh, laptop when I have it in there. And then there's two other things that are very helpful. Also, I've got better images coming up, but there's a, there's a sun shield put out by uh, Scope Stuff on the right hand side, you can kind of see it on the attached to the uh, 80 millimeter. And that's that's very helpful that when you're, you know, you're looking through the eyepiece or um, particularly when you're looking through the eyepiece, it's almost like you're holding your hand in front of the sun, but it's doing it for you. It's just it's uh, a lot more convenient. I don't I, on, on the MAS scope. I don't know if we still are. Are we still using salad bowls um, for that or did we spring for the, the $10 scope stuff sun shield? I'm not sure. There's a sun shield on there. Okay, good. Hmm. Um, so, and then there's the last thing is this Teleview Soul Searcher, which I'll show uh, in an, in another picture coming up. But what that's for is uh, when you're trying to locate the sun, right? You, you obviously can't look at the <clears> sun <throat> visually. Um, there are some tricks and trades that you can do to get the the sun to fall on you know in your scope and on your sensor without looking at it. You can use the the shadow on the ground. Um, and so forth. But this soul searcher makes makes it just so easy. Um, it projects a little dot on a uh, screen and you just move the mount so that the, the dot lands exactly the, the center of the screen and, and your, mm. the sun is in your... Uh, uh, oh, oh uh, Jeff? You. Yep. Yeah, could you go go back? Yeah. Um, question, uh, you, you say you use the Mach 2 and the, the, the 130 for your deep sky stuff. Yeah. Um, why, why don't you use the mini PC and the whole go-to setup and sit in the comfort of your of your office to do the sun work as well? So I I I, I suppose I could um, on the eighty millimeter. It really isn't possible because you have to be there in person to tune the edelons. Oh, sure, which, yeah. Which they do have a way to automate that. I've never seen it, um, and it's probably crazy expensive uh, hmm. to do it. So it, it just wouldn't be feasible on that scope. Um, also, you'd have to make sure that you do have autofocusing enabled, right? Because uh, focusing uh, is is very challenging on the sun and during the day with you know all the atmospheric turbulence and stuff like that. So you, you definitely want to have auto focus installed. I don't have it in activated in this configuration because I said it had it set up for visual. And then I would just throw on this this uh, quirk filter that I was just manually focusing with my fingers. I would zoom in on a feature and I, actually mm -hmm. I'll talk about that here in a minute, but um, zoom in on a feature, overexpose and get as sharp as possible and then back off on the exposure set, you know, set it up for imaging and, and go to my feature. But so that's what that's why I don't, um, because I got to be focusing manual, although I don't have to, I do have an autofocuser. Um, 
And the other, I guess the other thing, and I'll show you um, when I talk about the cork a little bit more in depth, is there is a there's a tuning on there as well. Oh, that is okay. a physical knob that you've just got to come down and, and, and change it, right? Ah, uh, okay. So you could. You certainly, I mean, it certainly would be nice. Um, so here's, this is just more screenshots of kind of the same thing. So I'll go through it quickly. So I, I mentioned the lap, lap dome. That's, that's the brand lap dome um, that makes it. And the laptop, obviously, I recommend a stand. It's a very nice, lightweight uh, computer laptop stand. Comes in very handy when you're doing this type of stuff. Um, on the left hand, lower left hand side corner there, you can see a close up of the pressure tuner, the Edelon, um, that is on the 80 millimeter sco scope. So there's two of those. Um, you don't have to have two. They have a single stack and then a double stack. Double stack um, narrows the I'm going to say this wrong, the, the bandwidth or band pass uh, down very, very narrow so that you get the better quality images um, when you have a double, double stack. And so you tune these uh, to, to look at different uh, features on the, the sun. So depending on how you tune them, you can look at the granulation that I mentioned on the surface of the sun. And then you tune them a little bit differently, and then you know you, even the promises will start popping out, um, and or, or sunspots might be more uh, contrasty. And so there's your that's the other reason, uh, you know, Dennis is that at least on that scope you're constantly fiddling with that, right? Depending depending on the feature that you want to look at. Yeah, no, I was just referring to the one to to the one thirty. Yeah. Um. This, because this is an 80 millimeter, this is what I'm calling my wide field. Um, there's a better shot of that uh, sun shield that I mentioned. Obviously the telescope itself, the AVX mount, um, and then the camera just for reference. And then here's a little bit better picture of the 130 setup with the uh, chromosphere, uh, Daystar chromosphere cork filter. Now that is powered. There's a little battery pack that I have Velcroed to the top there. It's a rechargeable, um, you know, like the same thing that we use to charge our cell phones if you have a, a spare battery um, and a little cord that that heats that element up. Um, it needs to be at a certain temperature to really be, uh, to perform well. And that little knob, which I'll show you in a different picture, is it just basically tweaks, and I can't remember what it is, but it, it tweaks the temperature every ever so slightly to get a little bit different uh, view. Looks like I got a, I don't have a sun chill that's not pointing at anything. <laughs> um, and then the scope of the mount. <clears throat> so here's a little bit more close up view of that uh, cork filter. Now it, it has a 4.2 uh, X Barlow built into it. And so when you uh, pair that with the F7 scope, you get about an F29, F30. Uh, uh, F ratio, which is exactly what this is designed for, optimized for. And so this particular cork filter, I think, is is designed for F. I got that next slide. I got it. It's optimized for F4 to F8 refractors. Um, obviously, the camera, and this is what I was talking about. That little black knob there is what you uh, turn left, turn right. There's little detent. Uh, clicks that you turn it, you know, one click, two clicks. To be honest, I have not really changed that too much um, because one of the downsides to this filter, although it's very, I mean, I want to say, I don't want to say very affordable. It's affordable um, it being that it's 1200 bucks. It can basically turns your telescope for 1200 bucks into a solar scope. Um, it takes time to warm up, right? Um, and get to temperature. So that little indicator light there is red until it's at temperature. And then as soon as you change that knob, even one setting, two settings, there you're you're waiting another 10 minutes or so for it to either cool down or warm up. So you have to be patient with with this one. Um, but it if as long as you're patient, it produces phenomenal images. Whereas the pressure tuners on the other scope are almost instantaneous. As you turn them, you instant instantaneously see um, the changes, and you can move on right away. 
Uh, the last thing that I'll mention on this <clears throat> picture is uh, you'll see right in front of the camera, I have a Zewo tilt adapter, and that's um, to combat uh, this phenomenon called Newton rings. I don't want to be, even begin to explain it. It has probably something to do with uh, interference um, in some, you know, some fashion. It, it produces this, this uh, pattern on the surface of the sun that your image, and I've got some images later on to show you, but it, it is very annoying and it, it produces, it makes you have very bad, ugly images um, where they have these big dark bands, light bands, dark bands, light bands across your image. Um, and so applying just an ever so slight tilt hmm. uh, so that that light is, you know, hits that sensor just as a slight off angle eliminates that, but you don't lose the, um, you know, hmm. the, the quality of your image. And I think I have a, maybe I have another picture. I I had another. So you can see how, how much I actually have it tilted there on the left-hand side. That's, I don't know, I don't know what that dimension is, but you know, it's a probably mm. one or two millimeters or so. It's, it's quite a bit. And I, and that was, I found that experimentally, right? I basically took an image of the sun with the exact same settings. And all I did is I, I, you know, I applied one full turn, took an image, applied two full turns, took an image, and I just experimentally found how much I needed tilt I needed to, to um, uh, add to make that go away. And I have an image, image at the end that kind of compares those that I, um, the way I determined that this was the best or at least optimal for me. Jeff, uh, Nolan here, long time, yeah. no, long time no talk or see. Um, yeah. The, that tilt adapter, I, my experience with uh, solar was, geez, even 10 more years ago at, with Northern Cross, they had a Coronado scope, which we'd able to borrow on weekends and whatever. And I did some imaging and maybe I didn't look at it very carefully, but um, never noticed that banding is this mm -hmm. just with the the quark, or do you use this also with um, your lunt? I I use this also with my lunt. So that that one seventy four millimeter camera is permanently well, it's not permanently, but I never take I never separate it from that that uh, tilt adapter. If I were to now go take that camera, the image on the the lunt, I take the tilt adapter with it. it they're just paired together now. Because I, I was experiencing it on both scopes. Hmm. Yep. All right. Thank you. And it, I was, I never knew about it. And I always kind of just dealt with it and tried to, you know, uh, deal with it in post-processing and kind of, you know, make it look a little bit better. But it never never really, uh, you know, did it justice. And then I got this and and my images have cleaned up, you know, considerably. Thanks. Hmm. Let me see if there was anything else on this one. I don't think I think I talked about everything on this one. Um, this this is just here for reference. If you guys are interested, I can uh, share the link. But it's put out by Daystar, um, and this is just a screen grab of of their website and all the the specs and what they uh, tout about it. So, uh, Jeff, uh, have you used the the quark uh, with uh, just a regular eyepiece? Oh, absolutely. This doesn't come with an eyepiece. This this is only the filter. You need to add your own eyepiece. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. But uh, did you do you see that those interference patterns with uh, with an eyepiece? No, interestingly, no, I don't. Yeah. It's so something, something with the them. yeah with the yep. image. Yeah, if you, if you Google Newton's rings and solar imaging, if you solar imaging Newton's rings. Um, I'm guarantee you the the first hit will will explain to you you know the physics behind what's going on mm. and what's causing that. Um, I'm not going to begin to try to explain it. Okay, so it's a it's a phenomena with the with the with the with the CMOS uh, camera chip. It must be, yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, Newton, so just, where Newton gets blamed for that? I mean, I guess I I don't well, know. Where, I, I, don't know where the name is, I don't know where the name is derived, but poor <laughs> Newton. Uh, so this is just another uh, couple of additional screenshots. It shows my laptop inside that lap dome, 
um, which really helps cut down on the glare so that you can see things. Um, it has that little shield in the front so that you can still access the keyboard, but it tries to hide everything else. It's very helpful. And then on the right hand side, that's what I was talking about that soul searcher um, device. It's kind of difficult to hear to see, but the arrow is almost near, almost pointing towards the little uh, hole. It's a, a through hole, and then the, the sun shines straight through that, and then projects a a, a, a light uh, round dot on the on the screen back there. And once that falls on that little white screen, um, your telescope is aligned to the sun. So it really takes out the, any guesswork trying to to locate the sun when you're at f thirty, right? There's a pretty uh, mm -hmm. narrow arc that you're looking through. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention yet is um, with, you know, you're you're looking using this 130 refractor telescope to observe the sun um, and the quark obviously does, you know, reject some of the uh, energy of the sun so that it's safe to view either with your eye or with your camera, but they also um, tell you you have to get this uh, UVIR cut filter to help at least eliminate some of the UV and infrared uh, wavelength just reflected out so it never even it enters uh, or passes to the to the, your eye or or to the to the sensor. So um, that is required in tandem with the uh, Daystar core. <clears throat> and that's just a two inch uh, uh, filter that I screw on to the uh, front of the diagonal. Let me see if I get a, going back here. So it's it's in the focuser tube here, but on the front side of that that uh, diagonal, I have it just screwed in there. Mm. I'm now I haven't made the mistake of forgetting that. Um, fortunately, I have uh, made the mistake though of forgetting to take the plastic dust cover off the front of the cork chromosphere filter and then I pointed at the sun and it burned a hole through the uh, dust cover. Thomas and Agnes were around to, to witness that. Um, hmm. I, and, and for the first half hour of observing, I just couldn't figure out why all of a sudden my images were kind of smudged. They, like they had this this black soot on the on the image. Like, what the heck is going on? And Lo and behold, I take the filter out and I see that the, the dust cover was burned through and whatever smoke must have happened deposited on the, the front uh, dust cover lens of the camera. Fortunately, it just wiped it off and it was I moved on. But just another note about, you know, using your head when you're observing the sun. Now I don't I don't touch the image train at all while it's pointing at the sun. If I'm gonna do anything, even change the camera or whatever, if I'm if disrupting that, that image train, I point away from the sun, do whatever I wanna do, and then I slew back to the sun just to make sure that I'm not gonna burn anything uh, or you know hurt myself. You did burn yourself, didn't you? Uh, there, yeah, there was, <laughs> that was again. That was lesson learned, right? I I took the filter off to uh, to blow, you know, use one of those blow uh, squeeze blow gun things just to blow some dust specks off, not realizing that hey, now I've got a telescope, you know, producing a giant beam of light. Fortunately, it was going through the diagonal and just pointing straight up, but my arm passed over that beam and I felt the heat like as you were touching a hot stove. So mm. fortunately I didn't look look into it or something with my eye. You know, I was trying to find dust particles and they, I could have very easily just said, oh well maybe it's on the diagonal mirror. Let me look. <laughs> Burn my eyes out. So, so with the with that filter at the diagonal like that, doesn't the scope itself build up heat inside there i have to imagine it does i mean that's i'm just surprised that you know that the filter isn't on the front end to keep a lot of that energy out i think it's probably my guess is and don't quote me on this but i i would guess that the 
the concentration of heat is at the focus point, right? It's it's probably not before or after it. It's really that's probably the most dangerous part. And where the filter is, it's not yet at focus. Right. So that's probably why it's okay to have that at that point. It's not really experiencing a ton of heat at that point. Okay. And same thing with the front objective, right? The refractor. It's just beginning to focus the light. So it's not concentrated at that point. Okay. Makes sense. So that that's equipment. Is there any questions before I move on to kind of the, the process of acquiring and and, and uh, processing the, the data? So now if you, if you don't have like a scope you have in, like in my case, I have an SCT and I can put a filter on the front end of it because that's what I have. Can yep. I do much of anything to, to grab stuff and process it or would I be just wasting oh, time? No, for sure. Yeah. If you have a, a white light filter, like mm -hmm. a Mylar that they put on the front. That's yeah. that's the same thing we have. Uh, you know, we have a I think it's a one thirty refractor at the club that uses a similar. Actually, uses a Herschel wedge. Not to take that back, but yes, if you have an SCT, you can put a, a, a filter rejection filter at the front, and you'll you'll be able to take white light photos, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll see sunspots. Um, you probably won't see. I don't think it's possible to see prominences and the the uh, other features that I showed you. With this, which is why both my scopes are H alpha. But okay. I wouldn't say it's not worth it for sure. We, I mean, it's very, you know, sunsets are very interesting, especially the larger ones. Okay. And I'll, I, I didn't mention, but the, the club has the exact same LUT scope that I have. Right. So by being a member, all you have to do is come out on a sunny day when a key holder opens it up and you can, you can be using that scope and, and we have everything you need to do the imaging there. Um, you just need to bring a thumb drive. Okay. All right. So imaging process, I, I mentioned that I wasn't going to focus too much on the details here because I'm not, not necessarily going to demo it. Um, but this is the overall process, right? You use some software to capture your images. Um, of two popular choices are SharpCap, which is what I use, and Fire Capture, which is a very another, another very popular um, free uh, image acquisition software. SharpCap is not free, um, but it's very affordable. I think it, I think I pay 15 bucks a year or something. Um, it's not much. Maybe it's a little bit more now. He might be charging more, but um, it's very affordable. And I, I use it for planetary, lunar, solar, uh, observe, imaging as well, uh, um, polar alignment routine as well. Yeah. So it, it's well, it's worth it's the, what he's charging. If you're if you're just going to use it uh, for solar like I do, um, the the free version of SharpGap uh, does virtually everything you need for. for does it? Solar. Okay. All yeah. right. I didn't know if he still offered a free version. That's good. Yeah. So yeah. Well, I, that's the one that that's the one that I use. And and unless you're doing polar alignment and some of the other you know specialty stuff or other type of imaging, but yeah. for solar, the the free version is is more than adequate. Perfect. Okay. When you come to the club, we have that on the laptops in the control room. So you just grab your laptop and camera, hook them up, and you're good to go. Yep. So do once you, have, you yeah, go ahead. Have, uh, with polar alignment, and you mentioned it. Um, do you just have um, mark spots on your driveway or something, or do you use something during daylight? No, it's a it's a good question. I didn't mention it. So the the other benefit to solar is that close is good enough right <laughs> so my my i don't know if i go back to the picture here oh that, that one that's a good one so you see this edge of the concrete here i make sure that the front feet of my telescope is on that line and i don't change the you know the azimuth or or uh, other settings that, well, from what what they are and it tracks you know, probably I bet it stays within the field of view for 30 to 40 minutes before I would have to bump the scope. Mm -hmm. And all I do is I just set it in place. That's it. So polar alignment is not critical. I mean, you need to be relatively, uh, you know, north, south and at the at a, at a reasonable 
um, or close on the, the altitude, but it's not super critical. Again, if, if you if you can keep it on the sensor for the two minutes that you're in imaging, that's all that matters. So once you uh, capture your data, which I'll talk about in a second here on the next slide here, you have to, um, uh, well, let me back up here. So what are we capturing? So this, the I use lucky imaging uh, technique, the same technique that you use for uh, planetary and lunar. So once you learn this technique for any one of those three, you learn all three um, because the process is the same. You capture the data, you, you basically capture a movie file. So you're actually capturing thousands of images in the form of a movie. And then we use software to turn those individual frames of that movie back into single images, sort through the good ones, the ones that are in focus or excuse me, sharp from you know low uh, atmospheric turbulence and so forth. And then we align those good ones and stack them. And so well, that's what AutoStacker does. Um, there's probably other software that I'm not familiar with, but that's that's generally the, the most popular um, free program that works very, very well to uh, do that part of it. Because you can, ima can you imagine you've got 8,000 images of the sun in a movie file and having to sort through all of them to pick out the best ones. Um, this one does that automatically for you and you say, I just want the 25% the best ones. And then it says, okay, I know which ones those are. So, so Jeff, um, uh, now I've only used uh, AVI. Is AVI the only format? Dot SER is um, actually what I use. Okay. I and I think it's, I only use it because for some reason, somewhere along the line, my computer forces me to use that. It's no longer, AVI is not an option. I think it's because I, huh. I changed to uh, mono 16 rather than mono 8 which is 8-bit versus 16-bit, mm. uh, what, what do you call it, uh, resolution or, I can't think of the word right now, but the, the level of, you know, uh, shades or, or gradients. Right. I think depth. that's the difference. So I, I use .ser, but AutoStacker just doesn't care. Whether it's AVI or SER, it doesn't care, it'll accept it. Okay. But it but it won't it won't take just just for the, the new folks out there it, it won't take an MP4 or an MOV. I don't think so. No, because those are those are compressed. Okay, I, yeah, I guess I don't know. I never tried that. No, because you 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 really want to get at the at the raw uncompressed frames. Okay. And AVI and and I guess this S would you say SER? Yep. Yeah, th those must be uncompressed uh, formats. Yeah, I, I think you're right. So once you sort through all those thousands of images that you took, aligned them, and then stacked them, it spits out a single image, generally in the form of a TIFF image, TIF. And if you have your settings set up correctly, it'll automatically send it over to this program called Registax which is also free, um, where we apply what's called wavelets to bring out some of the detail through sharpening. Um, the, I'll show you in a second here. There, uh, there are wave, wavelet presettings that some of our other members have made available. Um, I'll, I have a screenshot here later on. You could play for hours and hours and hours tweaking these six different levels of wavelets um, to your heart's content and maybe make a difference or maybe, 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 maybe not. Um, <laughs> but these presets certainly get you there a lot faster. So I'll show you what that is in a second here. And then I fit, this is an optional step, but I, I then finish it up in Photoshop. I, so I bring it over to Photoshop, um, after we export it from Registax and I add color and then I fine tune little tweaks, um, maybe change with the, the, the levels. Um, maybe do a little bit more sharpening if, if I think it's going to help. Um, and there's also, I can't remember the, the name of the feature right now, um, but it, it really helps amplify the prominences, which are very faint, without over amplifying the surface of the sun. So it really, it really kind of balances out. And I demoed that 
technique in an earlier MAS workshop that we had um, a couple of months ago. I have a link at the end of this presentation, um, and it, it's about an hour into that uh, that talk. It was Dennis, I think you gave a talk on something, and then I, mm -hmm. I followed up at the very end with just a quick demo on how to do that. So I won't cover that here tonight, but um, you can certainly check out our previous videos uh, about an hour into that that uh, that video. I cover how I uh, bring out the prominence detail without uh, blowing out the surface of the sun. So that's the overall process. Um, and then the rest of what I've got here is just kind of some tips um, along the way to help you be successful if you're going to try your hand at this. So this is a just a screenshot of what um, Sharp Cap like the image windows on the left, and then all your controls are on the right. Um, I mentioned that <clears throat> um, I shoot with a monochrome camera, so that's my preference. You certainly can shoot with the RGB, a one-shot color, um, but I I find that you you get um, it takes a lot less work, or it, it seems to be easier for me to shoot in monochrome and then fake the color in later. Um, I, because the sun is so bright, you really don't need to use any gain. So I have always have the gain set at zero. So I'm, I'm minimizing as much noise as possible. I choose that .ser file. I use Bono 16 because I want to have the, the most sensitivity to the different great, you know, shades of a light. And then I shoot in one by one. Um, adjust exposure time to find the sun and get focused. So I mentioned that soul searcher, right? You may be looking directly at the sun and see nothing on your screen. It may look as black as what I'm showing on your screen. And it's probably because you don't have your uh, exposure setting uh, correctly. And so it's often, you know, beginners will, will be wondering why, why I'm not seeing anything. And it's just because you don't have your exposure. So um, what I say is, is make sure you, the first thing I do is I, 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 bump the exposure way up just to make sure that I'm looking at the sun. It might look up like a blob. That's the other thing. You might be very, very out of focus. And so the light intensity falling on the sensor is kind of diffused, also uh, making it difficult to find the sun, even though you may be staring directly at it. Um, or you could be staring at the center of the sun rather than like the, the limb of the sun, um, which just makes it difficult. So adjust your focus, or excuse me, adjust your uh, exposure time. and then hopefully you'll see at least a portion of the sun um, on your sensor. If not, then bump your scope around to, to hopefully have it fall on the scope and get what I'm calling as a gross focus. So just get it close um, as best as possible. Then what I do is I, I kind of poke around the sun. I, you know, depending on this, the field of view you have on the, the LUNT scope, I can sit, I can fit the whole solar disk on the sensor at one time, but with the chromosphere, uh, chromosphere quark, it's at F30, right? So I'm only looking at a, a, a tiny piece of the sun at any one time. Um, so I usually go to the limb, the, uh, the outer diameter of the sun, and I just do a full circle around and looking at what's available, right, in terms of prominences, if there's anything out that day. Um, if I find something, I like prominences, which, which is what I suggest, I overexpose, so I, I bump the exposure up until it's like bright white and um, zoom in with the zoom control at the top there. And then I get a more refined focus and hopefully a perfect focus. And then once you have that, then I lower back the exposure um, to the, the exposure that I would use when I was going to image. Um, if you're if it's applicable, set your region of interest. So maybe you don't want to use the entire sensor to take your image because your frame rate would otherwise be um, lower than what you uh, are would like. So one technique is to only use a portion of the sensor, which will speed up your frame rate. Obviously, you're going to have a smaller picture is the you know the downside, but at least you get a lot of lot more pictures in a shorter amount of time. Um, and then adjust your exposure. This is what I generally do is <clears throat> I don't, if somebody asked me, you know, Hey, when you took that image, what exposure did you use? I wouldn't be able to tell you. I couldn't even, I couldn't even begin to even think <clears throat> of what my exposure time was because what I do is I strictly look at the histogram and I, I move that exposure slider until I get 
the histogram to be about two thirds of the way full. And when I get to that point, that's my setting. So whatever, whatever exposure time that is, I don't know. So, so sharp cap does record that for you, uh, Jeff. Yep, absolutely. That's, so, what that, that's what that histogram is down, down there. It's an angle, you know, it's an angled line right now, but once you start having light fall on it, it looks like a normal histogram that you're familiar with. Yeah, no, no, I meant in the, uh, it, you know, if you, uh, at the end of the session, you can save your configuration. Oh, okay. Yeah. So do us, you do just do a, what, you know, mess with all your settings, get, get, you know, where you want and just do a save as, and, and you can set up a, a, a profile of. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I, you're right. So at the top there, you'll see, you know, you can save a, a profile. Right. The reason why I don't is because when I'm looking at the center of the sun, you like maybe at a sunspot, mm -hmm. the settings are completely different than if I'm looking at trying to, to pull out the, the details on a prominence, right. which is super faint. And so I would have probably three or four profiles, depending on what feature I'm looking at. Right. For me, it's just a lot easier just to move that slider. Yeah, sure. And, and Jeff, have you ever, <clears throat> uh, I routinely use one of the focusing tools. Do you use any of the tools? I tried. I okay. I don't. I either I'm not using it right, or it's always on a really bad day where it's you know focusing in general is just difficult. But mm -hmm. I honestly I use the technique that I mentioned. I zoom in on a prominence, I overexpose, and I get as best I can by hand. Yeah. So I use the uh, Fourier uh, detailed detection right. focus tool and boy i tell you it's a no-brainer you you you're you're basically adjusting your focus to optimize these this bar graph and and boy i know I, every time i've tried that the bar graph turns green 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 and all of a sudden it'll go red and i didn't do anything <laughs> uh, oh so that's that's you're right it you know i'm not dogging it but it just does i've never really been either have patient enough or have mm -hmm. had success with it, but yeah, there are. You're right. There are. Is that so? That's in the free version, huh? The focus. Oh, well, that's tool? in the free version. Yep. Oh, that's probably because it doesn't work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jeff, uh, it, 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 my experience is it's pretty difficult to get working, um, and you have you wind up having to go like to one side, tell it to go to one side and move. Yeah, uh, you know, in or out, and then to get the backlash out and work from one side. But you have to be close to focus to get it to work. If you're way off focus, mm -hmm. yeah. it, you don't have a chance. And if you don't go like past your starting point and then bring it back, um, you've got that backlash in the focuser, and then it's lost. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, right. Yeah, I, I do a, do a manual focus first before I use that tool. Yeah. And um, there was somebody had put a, a YouTube out there um, showing how they did it. And after I tried his technique of, like I say, overshooting and letting it come back, and I don't even remember how I set it up now. I'd have to go back and look. Now, now at least I can get something out of it. Um, okay. That, that helps me. But you're not alone. <laughs> Jeff, um, with your, for focusing, when you're saying you're overexposing, is that visually or what are you doing? If so, on, so if you look in the center of the screen on, on the right there where it says camera controls, just below that is exposure. Mm -hmm. So there, that slider right there, I just slide it up so that you'll, you'll see what I, when you're doing it in real life, you'll see it. But basically, you know, the sun will be normally exposed. You'll see the surface of the sun and you'll see faintly the, the prominences. But when you when you slide that to the right, you're taking longer and longer exposures, right? And so now you're kind of uh, saturating the image, and everything will just go white. And so that's what I mean by overexpose. I'm not really paying attention to the disk of the sun, the, that part, because it's just blown out, just pure white. But the prominence is also pure white. But guess what? It's it's usually you know these bands that are uh behind have a black background behind it so i can i can sharpen 
um, as best as possible that contrast between the the prominence and the background. So I suppose if we were using, I'm used to fire capture, you you're just changing your gain or your frame or rate. It, it, you're, it, I think they have an exposure setting too. Okay, I haven't used it for a while, so okay. And then yeah. the other thing is, uh, if you're shooting a monochrome camera, and I only years ago shot with a color camera, does are you just shooting luminance or are you shooting all the channels? No, I'm just shooting raw. Uh, I, I don't have any other than the hydrogen alpha filter. There is no luminance, R, G, B. There's none of that, right? You just have the light that's coming through. That's it. Okay, so no filter in front of it other than the one that is in front of your scope. That, that's right. The, the they, they, Well, you have the UVIR cut filter just to reject some of the energy of the, the sun, but then the H alpha filter is... is is what it's passing through. So are you using that um, IR filter also with the LUNT? No, because no. that's a 80 millimeter scope and it's a different type of Set uh, yep. energy rejection system yep. that it doesn't require it. Yep, okay. Yep. All right, so hopefully you, you've adjusted your histogram to that, you know, to, so that it shows about two thirds exposed. Um, and then I just take a peek at my uh, frame rate to make sure that it's at least something reasonable. If you see in this screen grab that I did a while back, it, I was at 0.6 frames per second. That's going to take an awful long time to get 2,000, 3,000 frames if you're if you're doing that. Um, so if you are in a position where you're less than, and and this is just guidance. It's not it, it's not uh, you know it's just what I usually generally do. If I'm if I'm less than 25. Okay, well then I might bump up the gain a little bit, but I try to keep the gain as low as possible to so I don't introduce noise. You want to have frame rate of at least twenty five, I would say, uh, frames per second. And and the camera that you use, that frame rate varies, you know, very widely. Um, that's why I use the one seventy four millimeter because it's very good in terms of frame rate. Mm -hmm. If I if I'm doing a full, I'm using the full sensor. Um, I usually get between 35 to 50 frames per second after all my settings. That's an average. Um, it all again, it all depends on you know how how long of exposure you have um, that influences it. But if I'm doing unlike the uh, the LUNT, where I'm doing usually a region of interest, I'm only using a portion of the sensor. I can get 200 frames a second. So it really, it, you know, it really depends on your settings and the scope, and um, that's why there's really no, 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 you know, hard fast rule on what your frame rate should be. It's what you can tolerate. Um, and then you capture your video. And so usually what I do is I I usually go for a number of frames. And so up at the top here is a, a quick capture feature in that drop down. It gives you a bunch of choices. You can either say you know, capture a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand frames. You can choose, um, or you could go for time. You could say capture one for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, whatever you know is your preference. Um, I would recommend probably not longer than two minutes, um, just because the file sizes start to get really, really big, mm -hmm. um, and potentially the sun is dynamic enough that you know you might actually have. Uh, the first frame is different from the last frame so that when you go to stack it, it potentially is blurring the image. So I, I generally go for, it, again, it depends on file size and frame rate, but between one and 5,000 images um, at any one time. If you can get more, that's better. Um, but I try to keep my files below 10 gig. So like a 60 second to one to two minute uh, capture will turn into a 10, one 10 gig file. And so the bigger the file, the longer it takes to process it, depending on <laughs> how strong of a computer you have um, to process the, the data after, afterwards. So we're finished with sharp cap. We can put our telescope away and go inside and now uh, uh, process our data. And so this is a screenshot of what Auto Stacker looks like. This is Auto Stacker three. I think I think this is the latest version. I'm not sure, um, but they all look pretty much the mm -hmm. same. 
Um, this is, I'm not going to go through every setting, but you know, you, you follow the, it, as you hover over these things, there's tooltips that pop up and it'll tell you which one, which setting to choose, depending on whether you're doing lunar, solar, or planetary for this. And for, for uh, solar processing, you want to choose the surface. Um, you, once you pick the right settings, you hit analyze. And what it's doing is it's going through each, each and every image and it's trying to assess which ones are the sharp ones and, and you know, really crisp images, yeah. which ones are the bad. Um, this is probably a bad example because this plot, this quality graph in the middle, um, kind of shows that on average that, that really there's not any stellar great images. They're all kind of the same because, you know, otherwise you'd see that uh, the shaded gray line have some very hard, high marks on the left hand side and it would slope down. This one is kind of just flat all the way across, um, which either means that you it's all good. Well, actually, it's not all good because it's below the 50 percent, too. So. Um, but nevertheless, this is this is a typical graph that I would see. Sometimes I get lucky and I got a, one that you know, is on the upper half. That that was a, you know, you you captured two minutes that were very clear at that point of time. And it can vary from, you know, in within 10 minutes, the conditions can be completely different from when you started. So you hit analyze, it it's it produces that quality graph. You have two different options. Um, you can either choose a certain number of frames to stack, or you can say I want a certain percentage of frames and it always takes whatever um you choose the best frame so 20 percent best frames or you could say i want the the best 500 frames whatever you specify mm -hmm. um and it has multiple boxes there because maybe you want to do um you know do some trial and error and you say well show me the show me an image with the best 10 percent, the best 20 percent, best 30 percent, and best 40 percent. you could plug that into those boxes and when you hit stack at the bottom here, it'll spit out four different images that way so that you can do it all at once. Mm -hmm. um, so once you have the analyze, you have to go over to the right hand side of this window and add your alignment points. Um, I don't do anything fancy here. I have, a, if you look on the left hand side, the um, auto size is the bullet point over here is selected. So when I, I mean, I don't even choose 24, 48, 104. I just hit place alignment points grids, it will find it um, and then it'll auto size, uh, you know, what, what it thinks is the appropriate size. And I just let it do what it, you know, what it does. It uh, seems to work for me. The only, the only thing that I do play with occasionally is this minimum brightness. And so the reason why I, it, uh, I do that is because occasionally the prominences that will show up, you know, on this black region are very, very light. And so if it can't recognize that because the minimum brightness is too high, it will ignore those. And I want, I want to make sure that it's, it's uh, stacking and aligning on those features as well. So you may have to lower the minimum brightness for it to pick up the prominences. Um, generally, I keep it at 15 and, and it, it seems to work and pick up only all prominences um, that I've ever imaged. So once you uh, have that, now you have your alignment points um, that's not shown in the screenshot, but you've got all these little squares that appear on your image. Um, you hit stack and it basically, you know, chugs through the data and spits out an image. Mm -hmm. um, I've I used to do this, this feature here where you ask it to sharpen the image. Basically, if you select that, I think a, a box will appear and it says, well, how much percentage do you want to um, sharpen it or how much do you want to blend with an unsharpened image? And sometimes it works, sometimes you get lucky. Um, but personally, I, I don't even bother at this point because I'm going to take this unsharpened image and I'm going to use Registax to do that work. So I don't bother with that, that feature. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much this matters, but this is just what I do. If, in this image, there's there's a um, an anchor point. What I generally do is I put that anchor point on the the feature that I want to you know make uh, most prominent, and then you can use the plus and minus key, minus keys to change the size of that anchor region. And what I think it does 
is it focuses, if it has to make a decision when it's trying to do alignment and stacking and stuff like that, it prioritizes that area of the image over other areas. It, I think that's what it does. Don't quote me. Um, and I already talked about leveraging the quality graph to determine how much percentages you want to do. Um, you know, it's not always going to be 20%. Maybe if it's a really good image that you captured or a video that you captured and all the frames are good, yeah, keep them, you know, I think the, the more the better um, image that you, you uh, will have. So if you if you have a really good high quality graph that it, it uh, spits out, then you may want to bump that up to be 50% or 60%. Um, it's really trial and error to see, see what works best for you. Um, and then there is a, in the settings, uh, maybe under advanced at the top here, I'm not remember, I can't remember exactly sure, but there's, I didn't, it didn't used to have this and I was kicking myself when I finally learned that it did, did this, but in the settings here, you can enable auto stacker to automatically send it to Registax, which saves you a couple mouse clicks of having to save it and then bring it back into, um, Registax. I didn't know about that for years and now I'm. I don't know how I lived without it. So it just is a nice convenience. The only thing is that you have to have Registax already open in the background, or at least that's what I've experienced. Um, it will not open the program first. So if it's if it's open, it'll send it right to it, and then you can skip to the next step right away without um, losing any time. So now we take their, that image that AutoStackard spit out um, and sent to Registax. It will automatically load it if you have that setting there. And then these are the wavelets that I talked about that you can play with. Um, you can play with these sliders to your heart's content. You can move the denoise for each of these six levels up and down and sharpening up and down. Um, and it will change. It'll, it'll bring out features um, in the area that you're analyzing. It only does a small portion of your picture usually because um, you know the, the processing on this is pretty intense. And so it does it on a small section or a patch of your image, which you can choose. You just click on, like, if you wanted to process, oops, if you wanted to process this area, you would click on that part of the image, and then just that part of the image would be um, improved. And then once you're happy with the settings, you can hit do all. Um, it'll then apply those settings to the full image. And if you're happy with that, then you just say save image. Now, there are other settings. Um, over here, you can play with the contrast and the brightness. Um, if you're doing a one-shot color, you can do RGB align. So, that, you know, when your uh, your levels might not be fully balanced, this will help align them, uh, you know, for atmospheric uh, dispersion. Um, but it also, there's an RGB balance that you can apply. To, to be honest, because one, I shoot in monochrome, uh, any of the color features here or, or settings here I don't even bother with. Um, I use these more when I'm processing like Jupiter and Mars, but for solar, I don't use them at all because I, I plan on taking the, this image into Photoshop to do the final tweaks on brightness and, and stuff like that. Um, leverage the wavelets that are made available on the MAS website. So when you go to the MAS website, go to the members section, you scroll down a bit on the left hand side, it says files or something like processing files, I think is what it says. And you can see Lee Keith and, and uh, Paul Borchert have uh, made available the settings that they use. There's a lot more than this um, that have been shared over the years through the Google, Google group um, or emails or what have you. But these are the ones that are published on the, the site and they're more than adequate to get you at least started. And then you may you may use this as a starting point. You know, say you I often use Solar Scheme Four a lot. Um, that always generally tends to be a very good one. And then I've had you know made tweaks here and there to Solar Four, and then I like that, so I save that. So I have Solar Seven, Solar Eight, Nine, Ten. Right? And it can get crazy where you have so many. Um, I probably should clean that out because there's a lot that I don't use anymore, or I find myself never using. But definitely download those, and, and uh, that's a matter of just downloading these files and put it in the same directory that Registax program is in, um, and then they will appear in this dropdown when you restart Registax. 
I can't remember what my number two point was, but it's not just don't bother. It was don't bother doing something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. Oh, I think it was don't bother playing around with the brightness. That's what, probably what I was thinking. At least for solar, I don't bother adjusting the brightness or contrast here in Registax. I do that. I do that in Photoshop. I think that's what I was trying to write, and I probably uh, ran and got a cup of coffee or something at that point. <laughs> And then Photoshop, it's completely optional. I mean, you, once you exit out of Registax, you you have essentially a finished image that's that's pretty pretty dang good. Um, and you can share with your friends and family and post on the Google group or whatever you want to do with it and make it as your wallpaper. Um, I like to colorize it. And so I bring it into Photoshop and I play with the levels a little bit, uh, you know, on the, the brightness and the contrast. And uh, I apply a, a color to it. To make it look you know like our sun and um that's about it and, and when i'm happy with that i i uh i save it and, and share it with people um like i said this video here is is where i i walk in more detail through that so if you go to this this uh link here or if you just go to the if you search milwaukee astronomical society on youtube you'll it'll take you to our page and then on that page is uh astro imaging um playlist but there's not that many up there yet. You can find this and pretty easily and jump to an hour and then you can see how I do that. So that's it for my slides. How am I doing on times? Uh, great. Um, let's see if there's any questions. Yep. Because all I have left is, if, uh, is showing you a couple of images that I can quick quickly go through but is there any, any questions could you use registax to do everything uh what's the advantage of using auto stacker then going into registax i think you can um because i've used registax for probably the last 15 years and i do everything in it yeah so what he's referring to is the, you know i jump right to the wavelet part of this let me go back to presentation mode there, Registax, you're right, has the full ability to align, then stack, and then do the wavelet adjustments. Um, I think I did that early on, and yeah, it works. But I, I, I have found that I just, pref I have a preference towards auto stacker, and you know, I don't know if I can, you know, have any hard evidence, but I, I think that it does a better job. I don't know if anybody else has any opinions on that. Yeah, I, I migrated as well. I used to use Registack uh, exclusively, and and once I got introduced into AutoStack, uh, <laughs> I didn't, you know, never went back. Yeah. I think yeah. I tried that too, and I think the AutoStack was a little better at the stacking, but the wavelet stuff is crummy in the auto stacker. Yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, right. you're right. Registax strength is the wavelet part. Right. That's why I still use that. What were you saying, Nolan? Um, I've been thinking for years of purchasing my own solar scope. And if I wait long enough, I'll be, miss the uh, solar maximum. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's right. Um, you got another 11 years and it's right back again. Yeah, I, I'm just not getting any younger. <laughs> so um, the club has a Lund. Uh, yeah. you, you have a Lunt. I know my experience from the past, again, 10-year-old Coronado with Northern Cross. Um, what made you choose the Lunt over a Coronado? Is it just because you're familiar with the Lunt through the club or did you, is there some reason? You know, I'm tr I'm tr I think the club had theirs first, I, I think. Um, I was very happy with what the clubs had for, for one. And Lunt is a very good name, right? I think they they sell a lot of scopes and they don't have, to, to my knowledge, they have a very good reputation, good quality product. Um, the Probably the primary reason why I have a Lunt is because one of the former members put it up for sale and I, ju I jumped on it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> right? Yep. So, um, but I'm I, I'm happy with it. I have no intention of selling it ever, um, at least right now. Uh, I like both of them because... You know, the, the Lunt is, does the wide field, which I'll show you here in a second. You'll see some images where I have, I've taken this on the same day, the image of the sun with the full disc 
And then I take it with the 130 because I can really zoom in and see some of that detail mm -hmm. that you can't see in the in the line. Uh, Jeff? Yep. I have an answer to the question about why not using Registax for your uh, uh, stacking. Uh, it, so yeah. Yeah. It uses an older algorithm for debayering, which means turning the raw file into color. And okay. it uses uh, an older uh, alignment technique, or uh, it's just old. It works. Yeah, it's old and inferior. <laughs> yeah, old, but it work, but it doesn't work as well as uh, auto stack. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I don't even know if I know of anybody still using Registax to do that part of the processing. No, they I mean, shouldn't every, be. No. Yeah, everybody's migrated to auto stackers. <laughs> Jeff, we know you're still there. So, um, no, uh, the other Jeff. Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, we 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 weren't throwing any darts your way. So, <laughs> no, no, I'm just mentioning that you know, it, uh, if you don't want to monkey around with all these different programs, yeah, you, know, you can do everything with Registax. Yeah. yeah. It's just like I said, I think I played with the auto stacker too, and it did the stacking part better, but then the other stuff was pretty crappy. Right. You're you're right. It, it, I guess it's just been, you know, it's second nature to me now when I sit down to process these things. I just open up all three programs, you know, auto stacker, Registax, and Photoshop. And um, you know, it just I run it through the the sausage maker, right? And it just spits it out. Hey Jeff, why don't you put it together? Write some software that does all three. I, I'm not talented enough to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other Jeff, yeah. Oh, 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 that way. Okay. Or I'm Jeff. <laughs> uh, I got too many other things going in return <laughs> from the monkey with with that. <laughs> then he, you see the K9 VS. That's another hobby, and we're certainly looking for the. The maximum on the solar cycle so we can start making some contacts uh, on 10 meters any other questions yeah it's good so so the, the last i'll just run through a series of images to kind of show you um images i've captured and i don't know if you can see it you maybe have to step back a little bit but this is an example of that banding that i was getting you should see a stripe kind of here, sure. a stripe here, a stripe here, and it was just annoying. It's almost impossible to process it out. And applying that tilt adapter really made it go away. I think I have an image here later on that shows the comparison that I'll get to. These are in no particular order. These are just a bunch of images I, I threw in a folder that we can cycle through. This is an example of the, the lower picture was taken with the Lunt. So that's the size of image and, and resolution that you can get um, with that. Now you, this is you know way zoomed out. I can zoom in, and it's still pretty decent quality. Um, this is a very large image, but look at this, right? So you're looking at this sunspot region with the lunt, and that's the level of detail and granulation and stuff that you can see. And then now you take it with the one thirty. And you really start to see the details, the separation here, you know, mm. features um, of the sun. Don't forget the quality of the camera also. Should give some credit to the camera. <laughs> yep. So here's here's the region uh, on the Lunt. And then if you zoom in on the 130, this is what that region looks like. So mm. you really can start to see some of it, like this little uh what, what what do we call it dennis separated prominence <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's probably just a prominence <laughs> <laughs> there i caught one i captured one of my own there you go <laughs> but i just i love these these comparison photos and and the detail that that 130 i'm just been i've been more than tickled pink on it so i won't i won't belabor each and every image but you can see just here's more examples of kind of the same thing 
Um, this is that image that I remember I, I, I said I experimentally determined what my uh, tilt amount of tilt I needed. So this was zero tilt. And so maybe it's a little hard to see, but you can see the banding mm. um, happening there. This was a half a turn. This was a full turn. And then this was one and a half turns. And I, at this point, this is a dust mode here. But at this point, I felt that that was, you know, it has finally eradicated my banding. And so that's, that's where it's, that's where it's at today. Could you see that on your uh, laptop? No, that's a good question. I had to fully process it to be able to determine whether or not. So I I I did that. I I did. I took a sample image to make sure that the banding was there. Then made a turn, did the whole processing that I just mentioned, and did it four times. But I just walked you through that, you know, AutoStacker, Registax, Photoshop, these these programs to to process a data set with. I know I have. I guess I have maybe a little bit higher end computer, um, but it takes. I don't know, three four minutes tops hmm. to process an image through all those software. Um, once you get good at, you know, you know, I I know exactly what I'm doing and and what settings I want to tweak. So it's not a lot of time. Yeah, Jeff, I've, I've never, I, well, I don't use the same camera that you have. Uh, I use a, the ASI 120 on the club's uh, scope. Yeah. And I've never seen that banding in the, the club. It's, scope it's also Z, ZWO, right? It's a ZWO. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I've never, I've never noticed it either, but I'll have to look now, now that I know what to look for. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, I've, I was just looking through some of my processed images and I, I don't, I don't see it. You, you know what it showed up more for me on? It, did you, do you guys ever image with a Barlow? Because when I, when I would image on my Lunt, this is before I got my cork filter. When I would image on my, my Lunt without a, without a Barlow, you barely saw it ever. I, or you, if it was there, it was probably so faint you couldn't detect it. But when I put my two x two, I have a two and a half power mate that I would use when I want to zoom in on a feature. That's when it would amplify the banding. Yeah, no, I, I Lee, I, I do we even have a Barlow on the solar? Uh, not usually, but if there's one around. If you got to probably take yeah, it. Yeah, no, store. I don't, I don't, I don't use the Barlow on the solar. No, I don't either. Yeah. Not that you can't, but I just right. don't. So I think this is, so this is the color image. And then if you hit control I in Photoshop, it inverts it. And so occasionally on some of these images, I don't know, for me, this prominence that is, you know, almost it's partially towards us, but it's also connected. You can see how it's connected mm -hmm. and, it, and it projects into the limb of the thing. For me, this looks more three-dimensional to me, which is why I did the inverted version. Um, it's not as problem. obvious here to me. I remember that when it wrapped around the land like that. That was That's really right. cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it, it just helps you see things in a different way, right? I mean, look at this region up here. doesn't look all that special, but now it looks kind of cool, right? There's some something going on there. Like this, this here's another prominence that's just towards us that it doesn't look, it's a, what do they call it? A, Filament. Yeah, when you look it down on a prominence, it gets looks dark. Filament, right? Yep. Right. Hmm. So more, more filaments, more sunspots. Um, this was a. I think this was my latest images, just in uh, late December. I, I blocked out. I just drew, put a giant black square over the face of the sun because I really wanted to highlight this prominence structure here. This again was taken with the 130. Mm. Well, that 130 is a really, really nice machine. Yeah, I've been really happy with it. Yeah. Here's a, you know, another, this is the Lunt picture for that day. And there was so much going on. It had so many features that I look at me, I got, what is it, six or seven here um, images of zooming in on certain features. So this this is a huge file. This it looks big, you know, small on my screen, but you can really zoom in and see. Are those, are those all lunt? The the one so the ones that are lunt is this one in the middle, 
And this one is with the two and a half X uh, Barlow. And I think the, uh, let me think, this is probably a two and a half X Barlow, but the other, the four corners are the 130. Mm -hmm. So I, that's what I generally do is I'll image, you know, a more zoomed out view so that I can draw these boxes and then zoom in. This one I'm really happy with. I mean, you, you can't see this detail that you can see. Now, you, you know, you go over this, this image now and I don't know, I was really impressed with this. Mm -hmm. It was pr probably particularly good seeing that day. So I think just a few more images here. Oh, this one was, to, to me, this looked like a, like a headless woman wearing a dress. <laughs> I, I should add that if you're impressed with the detail on these images, the moon can be just as interesting and show oh, lots oh. of detail. Oh, yeah. 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 I did a post not too recent, not too long ago on the moon, right? I did some lunar imaging. I tried to image all the Apollo landing sites. <laughs> you don't need any filters or anything. It's a little, no, no, a little safer. <laughs> yep. And it's the same technique, same process, everything. Right. Actually, so I, I, actually, I use my H alpha on the moon. <laughs> but oh, on your scope, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. So that's kind of it. Is there any uh, questions? No, well, that's pretty nice, Jeff. Um, I also want to say that if you think the the images are fantastic, which they are. Imagine being able to see it with your eyes through a telescope. It's a, it's like looking at Saturn through a telescope as opposed to a picture. You know, you can be just amazed at what you can see through the through the telescope visually. Yeah, and any of you guys are welcome to stop out on a sunny day, um, and I can set the one thirty up. The one thirty visually is almost more impressive than those images that I showed you. Um, Agnes and, yeah, and I would expect so. Th Thomas and Agnes have seen it with their own eyes. I think they were, um, you know, in awe when they were here to observe it. I, I just, it's, it's phenomenal. The only downside to that quark is that you have to wait till it gets temperature. And mm -hmm. um, I, you know, this in late December when we were in those that cold snap, but it was a clear, clear day. Um, I had store, I was storing my quark filter out in my garage in, in my uh, tackle box mm. that I keep it in and everything. Of course, it was 20 degrees at temperature. So it took extra long for it to warm up that day. Now I keep it in the house. Now I keep it in the house. So I don't have to wait so long for it to get to temperature when I want to use it. Mm. Oh, very nice, Jeff. Very nice. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you. That was great, Jeff. And, yeah, so yeah, thanks. Now, for that. So now get out to the, get out to the club. Yeah, <laughs> on a sunny day in uh, May, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I typically open it up. I want to open it up late in the morning, uh, not too late in the day when people are starting to get busy, but not too early either, so the sun can get to reasonable height. Um, and just come out for an hour and take a peek, and then you can go do whatever you have to do on the weekend. So just kind of pencil it in for some weekend. I'll be, I'm always watching. Thanks, Lee. And thanks, Jeff. Uh, this is a great uh, uh, presentation. It'll add uh, uh, a lot of good information to our YouTube channel.